Could you please introduce yourself? My name is John Wilbanks. I work at Creative Commons. Okay. And you're giving the closing plenary talk at the TNC this year. So uh, can you just give me a, a brief introduction to the topic that you're talking about? Sure. I'll be talking about the impact of openness on networks and the way that networks work together. One of the things we've learned as we've moved towards a network culture is that making it easy to share things, whether those things are photographs or text or music, has a very transformative effect on innovation. Uh, but that effect hasn't really reached into the research and education services that these networks provide. So I'll be talking a little bit about why that is and, and what we might be able to do about it. And, and why is that then? Well, it's mainly that institutions are designed to resist change in many cases. They're designed to protect certain ways of doing things. And that's uh, a survival mechanism that's really healthy, especially in long-lived institutions like universities, um, which in Europe can run hundreds and hundreds of years old. Um, but it also means that some of the more positive effects of the Internet can take a little longer uh, to get to, to those institutions than they take to get to us as consumers. And how in your talk do you make this relevant to the research networking community that you're addressing here at TNC 2011? Well, we'll see uh, how well I do that. My, my, my main goal is to try to connect the earliest designs of networks themselves. So if you go back to the original sketches and ideas of the internet, you see some of the same concepts of openness and standardization, um, which is that anyone that was willing to implement a certain design could get onto the internet. Um, and openness and sharing in the way that, that we work on them at Creative Commons are really inspired by that. We, we try to recapitulate the way that the internet itself was designed, the way that the web was designed, and turn that into something that works for legal rights, things like copyrights, transfers, and, and uh, database rights, and so forth. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to connect a little bit through the fact that this is a network crowd and we're talking about a network approach to sharing. I'm just curious then, so if, if the openness was something that was in the original designs, what went wrong and are there lessons to be learned from what went wrong before in trying to start again in the Creative Commons approach? Well, it's a great question. Um, one of the downsides of open systems is that uh, is, is the same as the upside, which is that anyone can connect to it and do anything with it. So uh, alongside the power of email and the web, we get spam and phishing and you know, giant uh, anonymous attacks on Sony PlayStation and so forth. So um, you have to design to allow for uses that you don't like as well as for uses that you do like. And that's, that's an important thing to remember in terms of how we deal culturally with open systems. Um, in terms of Creative Commons, we haven't quite hit the size and the scale yet. We've only got around a billion objects worldwide under our licenses, which is actually a tiny amount when you compare it to the overall web. Um, so we haven't really begun to see those, those downsides yet. But if we are lucky, that will be the next set of problems we get to, to address. I understand that uh, you're involved with a science research project, science project at, the crea at Creative Commons. Uh, are you going to be talking a bit about that as well in your presentation? I will. Uh, th we've, we've learned a lot about the way that things like scholarly journals, uh, research data, um, get created and communicated and shared. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the way that networks uh, and openness together can begin to make science and research move a bit more quickly. It's one of the great ironies that the web was invented by a scientist for science, um, but it's actually kind of lame at science um, compared to the way that it's transformed our culture. Uh, even though it came out of a physics lab in, in, in Switzerland, it's primarily best for helping us locate you know, old items on eBay or buy new books on Amazon. And how do you anticipate that uh, with the Creative Commons approach, I guess you hope, uh, that uh, there could be a greater impact on, on science in future? Well, certainly through the, uh, the broader availability of scientific journals is, is the first piece. When we started the science project, there were fewer than 100 open journals in the world that were, that were counted. Now there's more than 7,000. Um, and a large number of those now carry Creative Commons licenses on them so that they're guaranteed. Uh, so I think that's sort of job one, is to get the research literature out there uh, so that you cannot just discover that an article exists on the internet, but actually read it. Uh, second is to, is to really start to stitch together the sorts of open data that we pay for uh, through our tax dollars, um, as well as the sorts of open data that we can capture about ourselves through smartphones and, and other sorts of systems. You know, I'm, I'm a new dad, and I've already got my son genotyped. Um, you couldn't do that five years ago. And over the next five to ten years, we need to learn how to put that information that I can gather about myself or my son or my other members of my family and put that together with the public taxpayer-funded traditional research data. 
And open networks are pretty much the only hope we have for that. It's just too complex of a problem to outsource to one company um, or, or, or even one set of companies. And what do you think are the greatest challenges now in the way? I'd say scientific culture is probably the biggest challenge. Scientists are not used to working together. Uh, scientists are not used to um, um, being rewarded for being open. Uh, the, the vast majority of scientific rewards come from uh, keeping things private. You get more money, you get more grants, you get uh, more papers if you don't tell people what you're working on um, until it is complete enough that you can publish a paper on it. Uh, there was some conversation here about uh, when Kepler and, and Brahe worked together 400 years ago at the beginning of this conference. Uh, but when you go back even to um, uh, Newton's laws of gravity and physics uh, to the original calculus, these were prompted by the fear that someone else would publish first, not by the desire to share with the world. And that culture of keeping things closed and private until um, they're complete enough to take credit for them is, is a big part of the problem, I think, probably the biggest. And do you see any specific challenges ahead uh, as regards the research networking community? Well, I think that uh, the research networks were designed primarily for moving bits around. They're very technical. And the concerns of the community were very much um, um, infrastructural. So making sure that the network stayed up, uh, to make, making sure that they gave data uh, fast enough across the net. Um, moving towards providing services for the users to make sure that uh, services like curation of data to make sure that when a scientist in the United States says that it's 10 o'clock and 20 degrees, um, we can correlate that to Europe and say it's actually uh, 22 o'clock uh, and, and the temperature is in Celsius. Um, because computers don't know any of that unless we teach them. And those are the sorts of services that um, Terena and the research networks can provide to their users so that the users can focus on doing science. Well, let's hope they do, and let's hope that your talk goes well. And thank you very much for talking to me now. My pleasure.